Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Cleaves. I'm a professor at the Earth Life Science Institute at the Tokyo Institute of Technology and a member of the Institute for Advanced Study. And I'm going to be talking to you today about prebiotic chemistry with respect to the formation of precursors and simple molecules. So to begin with, what is prebiotic chemistry? Well, you can either think of it as the study of the chemistry which leads to life or the study of the chemistry which occurs before life appears. This it should be distinguished from abiotic chemistry, which is a chemistry which occurs in the absence of life. For example, petroleum matur maturation or the diagenesis of biological material. There's obviously some overlap in these two concepts, but it's important to focus on the conceptual aspect of making life from non-living materials. So what's the point of studying prebiotic chemistry? Well, simply put, in an astrobiological context, we'd like to understand how life originates from non-living material and whether this is a difficult or simple type of problem or a rare or common phenomenon in the universe. It might be helpful if we had a definition of life on hand in order to conduct adaptive studies, but this is a notoriously problematic issue both among scientists and philosophers of science. That said, even if we can't come up with a definition of life we can all agree on, we can still make progress by trying to understand how chemical systems behave and self-organize under environmental conditions. So what is the purpose of studying prebiotic chemistry? Well, fundamentally, we'd like to understand how life originates from knowledge material and whether this is a difficult, simple, rare, or common phenomenon in the universe. The relationship to astrobiology is obvious. To do so, it might be useful, probably is, for us to have a definition of life, but this is really a notoriously contentious topic among scientists and philosophers of science. But I think even if we don't have a definition of life we all agree on, we can still make progress by trying to understand how chemical systems behave and self-organize under environmental conditions. Importantly, I think prebiotic chemistry is related to the field of systems chemistry, which tries to understand how collections of molecules behave together to give rise to new emergent phenomena. Now, if we consider a contemporary cell, we can think about what some of the functions of that system are and what it's composed of, how it's organized. And it's important to recognize that despite being a very small um, entity, a cell, perhaps only a micron across, packs an incredible amount of molecular information into itself. Now, the primary function of the cell is to take energy and building blocks or raw materials, convert it into its own organization, maintain that organization, and convert um, some of that material into waste and under ideal conditions, more cells with the same kind of functions. Now it's important to recognize that a modern cell is complexly organized. It contains a variety of highly coordinated processes, which probably didn't spring into existence in one go. The information inside that cell is heritable. That's an important aspect of defining a living thing. And then it's mutable over time. And what this means though, is that the modern organization of a cell is probably the result of some protracted period of chemical and biochemical evolution. And I think we should keep this in mind when we try to understand prebiotic chemistry and what its point is. As a counterpoint to this set of ideas, I like to think about um, T. Burganti's conception of a chemoton. T. Burganti was a Hungarian biochemist working in the, the mid and late 20th century, who came up with this idea that living systems, cells, are really little machines that aggregate a bunch of molecular subsystems to, to create a holistic, self-maintaining or self-reproducing entity. And the important aspect of this is that he understood that there had to be subsystems functioning in this overall whole that did particular sub subroutines for the system. For example, um, the metabolic work to make the components of the other subsystems, perhaps having a subsystem that encapsulates or keeps all the components in a temporal or spatially organized way together 
and some sort of informational subsystem that helped um, maintain the organization of the cell over time, or the chematon over time. And what I think is really significant about this kind of conception is that it takes into account the, in the relative um, ensemble properties of the subsystems without really saying what the molecular identities of those subsystems have to be. Right? So in fact, many types of molecules might be able to come together to make a chemoton-like whole. And that's important to keep in mind when we're studying these really um, diverse and complex molecular ensembles which get made by prebiotic chemistry, that they might contain really interesting phenomena that we're missing entirely because we're studying only compounds of biochemical relevance. And I think we want to keep in mind when we go to look for life on other planets that it might be composed or organized in different ways than contemporary terrestrial life is. So I'm showing here, to put this in perspective, a very simplified timeline of the history of life on Earth, um, starting from the modern day contemporary biochemistry we have various types of fossil and molecular and isotopic evidence for life on Earth going backwards in time. At some point, we run into a situation where it's very difficult to say whether certain evidence is really um, consistent with biology. And we can start from the other direction um, with the, the formation of the Earth and work forward to when we think the Earth's service conditions had calmed enough to allow for the existence of liquid surface water. And if we think of these two events, um, the existence of surface water and the oldest agreed upon evidence for life being bookends for the origin of life process, this gives us about an 800 million year window um, for this process to occur. And what's important about this is, as we've heard in some of the previous talks, there's a lot of questions um, that are still unanswered about the Earth's surface environment during this period. So here's a general scheme for the origin and evolution of life. We believe that some set of environmentally supplied molecules gave rise to more complex molecules over time to structures and networks, perhaps then to more integrated molecular systems, things that were having feedback control over each other, and ultimately to something we could agree upon as being living. Um, so here we have prebiotic chemistry contributing to this process of the origin of life. There may be some variable amount of time between the origin of life and this, the organism or set of organisms called the, the last universal common ancestor, which is a set of organisms that already had most of the um, molecular properties common to contemporary organisms. Again, um, we'll highlight the fact that there is potentially 800 million years available for making this transition um, from prebiotic chemistry to the origin of life, we really fundamentally don't know if you need that much time or maybe 100 million years, maybe 1,000 years, maybe 100 years, maybe less. Um, it's an important thing to keep in mind when we do these kinds of laboratory studies. Now, there may have been various types of processes that contributed to Earth's primitive organic inventory including extraterrestrial delivery, which we've heard about in previous talks, um, geochemical synthesis, which we've also heard something about earlier. <clears throat> and here I'm going to focus a little bit more on atmospheric synthesis, which we've also heard more about. But the important thing to recognize in all of these processes is that there are a bunch of inherent variables in each of them that affect the types and quantities of organic compounds we produce. Now, on top of this kind of complexity, we have the variables of the Earth's primitive environment itself. Right? So we can think about organics being delivered to primitive aqueous environments, and then the aqueous phase chemistry of those environments also matters. Things like the temperature, the pH, the types of reagents that are provided to them, the relative concentrations and absolute concentrations of those, and so on. And if you want to go to a slightly more complex set of considerations, we can start thinking about things like interfacial chemistry. Um, the adsorption of compounds on mineral surfaces. Well, we might start to worry about what kind of mineral surface is it and what sorts of adsorption conditions are we working with. Are we operating in environments 
that are shallow enough to experience intermittent wetting and drying, so evaporative cycles. If we're working in shallow environments, we might have to think about the impact of solar radiation on the chemistry present in those environments. So you can see there's a lot of environmental variables which can really affect um, how these systems play out over time. So as we said, there are a variety of unknowns regarding the Earth's primitive surface environment that probably have a large effect on how prebiotic chemistry plays out over time. For example, the oxidation state of the atmosphere, whether it was highly reducing or highly oxidizing, or some intermediate or variable oxidation state over time, what the pH of primitive surface waters was like, including interstitial water, which may be governed by the host mineralogy, what the temperature or temperature range of surface environments was like, We've heard in various talks previously that there's some debate over the abundance of emergent land masses, um, including early continents or volcanic islands. And the point being that since we don't really have a complete picture of the types and dynamics of early Earth environments, it would probably be a good idea for us to try to understand the broad set of chemical parameters that might affect prebiotic chemistry so that we can make predictions about how changing the environment would affect their outcome. It's important to put this idea of prebiotic organic chemistry being important for the origins of life in some historical context. This idea of a heterotrophic hypothesis was developed almost simultaneously by two scientists, J.B.S. Haldane and A.I. O'Barren, in the early 20th century who both reasoned that the earliest organisms probably lacked complex metabolism and then were dependent on environmentally supplied organic compounds for both their energetic and compositional processes. Both further reasoned that conditions on the early earth may have been very different than at present. Both were aware of the idea that oxygenic photosynthesis was relatively um, a relatively late invention by evolution, and that conditions on the early Earth might have been more favorable for the formation of organic compounds and then the spontaneous generation of heterotrophic organisms from them. Now, this idea of a, the heterotrophic hypothesis remained largely speculative until the early 1950s when a young graduate student named Stanley Miller um, conducted his now famous experiment showing that, in fact, biological amino acids could be produced relatively simply and quickly under conditions simulating the early Earth environment. And this formally opened up the idea of uh, experimental study of prebiotic organic synthesis and prebiotic chemistry. So here are a few photographs showing the Miller apparatus. It's a fairly simple, um, elegant apparatus constructed of simple laboratory glassware. It has two round bottom flasks connected by various pieces of tubing, and it simulates an early earth hydrologic cycle. So the bottom flask contains water, which is heated by this heating mantle, driving steam up this tube which then enters a second chamber. The second chamber um, is filled with a variety of gases that the experimenter chooses. In this case, Miller used hydrogen, methane, and ammonia. Within this flask also, there are embedded two tungsten electrodes through which an electrical current can be passed, which then creates an electrical arc between the gap between the two electrodes. After a few days of operation, the action of the electrical discharge on the gases contained in the apparatus and the flux of steam throughout the apparatus can visibly be seen to have created a large amount of organic compounds, many of which are um, rained out into the original aqueous flask, um, partly by the operation of a condenser tube, 
which circulates cold water around that steam, condensing it and returning it to the water phase for a further operation of this simulated hydrologic cycle. Now, using the analytical techniques of chemists of the time, Miller was able to show, using two-dimensional paper chromatography and in hydrant staining, that there were, in fact, a variety of simple amino acids generated in this experiment. The fact that they were detectable at all was quite remarkable. Um, so here we see uh, a nice spot for glycine, a certain amount of alpha alanine, aspartic acid, beta alanine, alpha amino and butyric acid. Now that was of course remarkable and, and significant in the context of the theory for origins of life of its time. But of course, analytical techniques have evolved over time and a reinvestigation of these original extracts using more modern chromatographic multidimensional analytical techniques showed that in fact, there is a really large variety of non-proteinogenic amino acids also produced in these reactions, along with various small amines. And here we see a plot of their relative abundance as a function of molecular weight. The point being that, in fact, there was not a lot of control or steering of these reactions necessarily towards compounds of modern biochemical interest. And there's a lot of other compounds that get made in addition. If we go one more level deeper into doing the untargeted analysis, um, high resolution mass spectrometry of Miller-Urey type experiments shows that there are in fact hundreds or thousands of discrete um, molecular mass um, species generated in these experiments, and bearing in mind that each of these peaks represents an individual um, formula weight of compound, but there may be multiple potential um, structural isomers for each of these formulas. So in fact, the molecular diversity can be extremely large um, compared to what is perceived from things like paper chromatography. Now, I should mention that there are some similarities in the types of organic compounds that have been measured in Miller-Urey type electric discharge reactions and those that have been measured from carbonaceous meteorites. And in fact, a study using high resolution mass spectrometry from 10 years ago showed that in fact, the Murchison meteorite may contain several million distinct organic compound types. So again, each of these peaks in this mass spectrum represents a unique molecular weight compound or a unique molecular formula. But if one accounts for the types of structural and stereoisomerism that is typically present in organic compounds, there could be 50,000 to several million distinct molecule types containing um, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus present in these kinds of meteorites. Now, the important take home message here again is that we know what only maybe a fraction of a percent of this material actually is in terms of its molecular identity. And it's potentially true that we're overlooking compounds or compound classes that are really important for the origin of life, but which are not present in contemporary biochemistry. So, how does an Oriuri experiment uh, make this kind of organic diversity? Um, I said, I think it's an example of, of systems chemistry sort of thinking. Uh, basically, a few simple gases are converted into a few reactive intermediates. Those intermediates can further react to form products. Those products can react again with the, those products, and you get a cascade of combinatorial diversification of products. And what's important to keep in mind is that each of these individual reactions can have its own kinetic parameters as determined by temperature, pH, concentration dependence, and so on. And so the overall system can be somewhat sensitive to environmental parameters, right? So this is an example of a low temperature Miller-Urey experiment. So the water isn't boiled. Um, and you get, a, a, in many instances, a very different distribution of small molecules in the product um, soup. So how does this work again? We're starting with simple gases, applying electric discharge. Um, this is ionizing or converting them into radicals, which recombine in the gas phase. 
the different species generated have different propensities to dissolve in aqueous phases. I've colored the more water-soluble species in blue. Um, those can segregate into the aqueous phase, either being carried through steam or by molecular diffusion, whereas the species that are not especially water-soluble stay in the gas phase. So you can have some evolution of this chemistry over time as the various relative concentrations of gases change as well. <clears throat> What's important to recognize about a lot of these kinds of species, like HCN and hydrazine, methanol, formaldehyde, is in fact these are um, compounds that we see widely distributed in extraterrestrial environments. So this small set of reactive intermediates becomes the focus of prebiotic chemistry partly because we've seen their generation through the kind of chemistry taking place in Miller-Urey experiments, the kinds of things we observe on moons like Saturn, um, and the fact that we can observe some of these species in protoplanetary disks um, beyond our solar system suggests that this kind of initial gas phase chemistry is really quite universal um, and, and it generates a really common set of reactive intermediates. And I'd just like to point out that uh, here's a study by Stribling and Miller really highlighting the importance of the oxidation state of the gas mixture on the efficiency of production of things like hydrogen cyanide and formaldehyde. So really reducing gas mixtures are much more efficient at producing cyanide than more oxidizing ones. Um, and it tends to be true for formaldehyde as well, though in this case carbon monoxide is the most efficient for its production. So shortly after Miller published his first paper on his apparatus, he went back and tried to understand the actual aqueous phase mechanism of production of the amino acids that were observed in it. And here we're looking at a chart of the concentration of a species versus time since the discharges began. And we see the input ammonia gradually being consumed over time. We see the initial rise in production of hydrogen cyanide, kind of plateauing and a decline over time, and a similar kind of behavior for measurable aldehydes. As products, we see amino acids rising in time as these other species are declining um, and plateauing after a certain amount of time. So Miller deduced from this, the behavior of these species that they were probably working together to make amino acids um, via a mechanism known as the Strucker amino acid synthesis. And what that simply involves is the reaction of an aldehyde or ketone here, generated in the gas phase, reacting with hydrogen cyanide, also generated in the gas phase. Now, these have both diffused into an aqueous phase, reacting together to form a compound known as a cyanohydrin, it's a reversible reaction, and then depending on the abundance of ammonia, um, either hydrolyzing to give a hydroxy acid or adding ammonia and then hydrolyzing to give an amino acid. So Miller further convinced himself that this was likely one of the major operative mechanisms for this um, by finding the isostructural hydroxy and amino acids um, for each of the species he was able to detect. So if he found alanine, he also found lactic acid. If he found glycine, he also found glycolic acid and so forth. This may not be the only mechanism by which amino acids are formed in this, but it is one of the dominant ones. So I should point out though, um, one can skip the electric discharge aspect of this experiment and sim simply take the small reactive intermediates and mix them together and study their chemistry. And so here's an example of just using what are formally the precursors for a glycine structure synthesis, um, ammonium, cyanide, and formaldehyde, put them in water, room temperature, let them react. And what one finds is not simply a mixture of glycolic acid and glycine, but a really complex mixture of hundreds or thousands of discrete um, molecular mass compounds, which again could be representative of many more isomers. And in fact, glycine is not even the major peak detected and probably only represents a few percent of the overall product mixture at the end of the reaction. The point being that there really may be other mechanisms operative in these systems that we haven't really appreciated the relative kinetics of 
Um, so there's still a lot of, of mysteries in how these reactions proceed. They're quite complex. We looked a little bit at the importance of HCN in amino acid synthesis, but prebiotic chemists have also become interested in hydrogen cyanide because of its possible involvement in the formation of nitrogen heterocycles, including purines. Lana Rowe found in the early 60s that in fact, if you put fairly concentrated hydrogen cyanide in slightly basic water, you could directly synthesize measurable amounts of adenine, which is a purine important in modern biology. Over the years, prebiotic chemists worked out various mechanisms to explain this. And what they presently believe is that there are various self additions of cyanide shown on the top row here, where cyanide reacts with itself to form a dimer, then a further HCN molecule to give a trimer, then a further HCN molecule to give this tetramer of hydrogen cyanide known as diaminomalonitrile, or its abbreviation DAM. They then found that DAM could be converted by ultraviolet light into its trans isomer, diaminofumaronitrile, which could further be converted by ultraviolet light to an imidazole compound, which could serve as the precursor when reacted with very small molecules to a whole suite of purine isomers. So this is interesting because now we're connecting concentrated aqueous phase hydrogen cyanide chemistry with photochemistry. And that's starting to say that this kind of chemistry might only be operative in photic environments. But this group of scientists included Leslie Regal and Sanchez and Jim Ferris, um, tried to understand the environmental parameters that would govern or favor when purine synthesis could take place, hoping that would help constrain the types of environments that would be needed for life to emerge at least prebiotic chemistry, to be productive. And they recognize that in dilute solution, the dominant reaction of hydrogen cyanide is simply hydrolysis to give formamide and ultimately ammonium formate. In more concentrated solutions, this formation of cyanide tetramer can proceed. So they made what I think is a very clever plot, which really demonstrates the interplay of concentration, temperature, and pH and competing reactions on the overall outcome of systems. And what this plot is showing is a series of concentration isobars where the rate of hydrolysis and the rate of tetramer formation are equal, right? As a function of pH and a function of temperature. So if you have fairly high concentrations of starting hydrogen cyanide, um, you get some boundary condition where the rate of hydrolysis and tetramerization is equivalent as a function of pH. Right? And what they found that's quite interesting though is if you have very low concentrations of cyanide, in fact, lower temperatures and lower pH values are much more favorable for the formation of dam. Right? And in fact, you may need to start getting down into temperatures um, near freezing if you don't have a very efficient supply of hydrogen cyanide to the starting reaction. Of course, it's, it's fair, relatively easy to measure the rates of hydrolysis of these kind of compounds. And in, this is work that um, Shin Miyakawa, myself, and Stan Miller did about 18 years ago, looking at the environmental um, parameters for HCN and formamide hydrolysis. And what you can appreciate here, this is a plot of the log of the rate of hydrolysis versus pH, um, that in fact, these compounds are much more stable at low temperatures and there is a sort of pH sweet spot for their survival. Um, so again, this is, points out the importance of these environmental parameters of temperature and pH. Um, and we see the same thing for formamide, it's a slightly less complex pH rate curve but again, much more stable at low temperatures than even slightly higher um, temperatures by, by factors of, you know, an order or two of magnitude um, per 10 degree rise. So the importance of this is that we can now plug in different 
production rates, depending on what we think the atmospheric uh, composition was and what the energy flux was, and see what sorts of thresholds of concentrations we can get to using known hydrolysis rate constants. Right? And so this is basically trying to, to compute a steady state, something like filling a leaky bucket. The water level depends on the rate of egress of water and input. So we can take as an example, uh, an ocean of the current volume of a given pH or mean temperature and a given influx rate of hydrogen cyanide that could be extraterrestrially delivered, delivered through atmospheric synthesis and determine um, the mean concentration of hydrogen cyanide at steady state. And what you see, what we found recently here was that low temperatures are better um, and slightly lower pHs are better for the accumulation of significant concentrations of hydrogen cyanide and formamide. Now, it's important to take into account that this is estimated for an ocean volume of the current size. If you consider things like puddles or small ponds that are much shallower, um, you could uh, obtain much higher concentrations of these compounds um, at steady state simply because the volume is smaller. So this may be an important consideration um, in thinking about environments where this type of chemistry might have been important on primitive planets. So in summary, we looked at a few basic types of simple prebiotic processes and how they might be interpreted in terms of the time scale that's available and the different types of environmental parameters that we don't completely understand yet. And we see that prebiotic chemistry encompasses a large set of questions about the synthesis and reactivity of organic compounds in primitive environments. As we saw, there's a lot of potential downstream effects that some of these variables can produce in prebiotic chemical systems. So there's a lot of room for environmental parameters to steer prebiotic chemistry. Things like the composition of the atmosphere and atmospheric dynamics can really change what kind of molecules get delivered to the surface. The types of surface environments they get delivered to and their properties in terms of temperature and pH, various dissolved and organic species can also have really large effects on the outcomes of these kinds of reactions. Probiotic chemistry can make compounds of modern biological relevance and those are often the ones we search for, for obvious reasons, but it often does so alongside thousands or even millions of other compound types. Understanding this chemical diversity and how our particular biochemistry was selected from among it remains a major challenge. We're gonna to have to develop new types of analytical techniques. We're gonna to have to develop new finds, new ways of discovering strange molecules, what we might call needles and haystacks, um, but I think we're on the verge of being able to do this with modern techniques. The prebiotic chemists can't be completely certain which compounds or mechanisms or environments even were the most important for the origins of life. So there's still plenty of opportunity for discovery. And by that, I mean discovery of new types of molecules, um, new reactions which produce them, new systems of interacting molecules and so forth. The future is undoubtedly full of a lot of surprises, and I look forward to seeing what everybody out there discovers in the coming years. So I want to thank you all for tuning in and listening, and I'll look forward to the discussion a week from now.